Welcome to this week's episode of The Land Doctors. So it's been snowing here, it's been cold for days, I've been cooped up in the house with a wife and kids, but unfortunately, I've got a job to do down in Costa Rica. I'm flying out first thing in the morning. It'll be 80 or 90 degrees tomorrow. I'll be in a Hawaiian shirt and shorts and flip flops. and It's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. This program is sponsored in part by the Oklahoma Energy Resources Board. The OERB is voluntarily funded by Oklahoma's oil and natural gas producers and royalty owners, and their funds are being used for well site restoration and student education all across the state. Since 1993, the OERB has restored more than 13,000 orphaned and abandoned well sites at no cost to landowners or taxpayers, employing Oklahoma contractors all along the way. The OERB is proud to serve the state of Oklahoma. Daddy, where did those come from? Well, let me tell you. Plains Kubota, your Oklahoma Kubota dealer and proud sponsor of the Land Doctors. Kubota, for Earth, for life. This program is sponsored and produced by the Land Doctors Management Group. We all know that Oklahomans belong to the land, but even the best of us need a little help from time to time. If you've got a spot of land that you love but would like to make it even better, we're here to help. Whether it's wildlife, water management, natural resources management, environmental cleanup, or even real estate development, these doctors are always on call. I love the smell of fresh dirt in the morning. It smells like victory. <laughs> <laughs> I need the Oklahoma wind to run open through my veins. I need the Indian grass to cut right through this long and lonesome days homeward bound. I'm homeward bound I hear a scissor tail calling me from the red bud trees I hear the top water roar in the still of the day as the bass enjoy the feast homeward bound I'm So this is a dramatic improvement over the ice and snow that I just left yesterday. I think I'll stay here for a while. This week I hop on a plane in Oklahoma City, fly to Dallas, and then over Mexico, Belize, Nicaragua, and finally to Costa Rica. As I'm flying in, I'm surprised to see the extreme elevation changes. In my mind, I thought this place would be flat, but I'm seeing mountains, deep gorges, and huge expanses of rainforest. Someone mentions to me that they filmed part of Jurassic Park here, and I don't know if that's true or not, but I can certainly believe it. A local points to a volcano in the distance, and it truly sinks in that I'm not in Oklahoma anymore. I soon find out that Costa Rica has six active volcanoes and over 60 inactive ones, and I silently pray that they stay that way until I get out of here. And oh, by the way, they have earthquakes almost every day, but I'm assured that they're just little ones. But if you can get past all of that, Costa Rica has become one of the most stable, prosperous, and progressive nations in Latin America. Although this country only has a fraction of a percentage of the world's landmass, it contains 5% of the world's biodiversity. Amazingly, 25% of this country's land area is in protected national parks and protected areas. 
Costa Rica has successfully managed to diminish deforestation from some of the worst rates in the world from 1973 to 1989 to almost zero by 2005. That's important because these forests are home to four different kinds of monkeys, including the white-headed capuchin, the mantled howler, Jeffrey spider monkey, and the Central American squirrel monkey. Over 840 species of birds have also been identified in Costa Rica, including the resplendent quetzal, the scarlet macaw, three-waddled bellbird, bare-necked umbrella bird, and the keel-billed toucan. Costa Rica is also a center of biological diversity for reptiles and amphibians, including the world's fastest running lizard, the spiny-tailed iguana. What truly amazes me about Costa Rica is the water. The color and the sheer amount of water, plus the waterfalls are breathtaking. People come from all over the world to experience the beauty and thrill of Costa Rica's water firsthand. Some do it by trekking to waterfalls, others by lounging in hot springs, and there's always someone rafting down a pristine river. Ecotourism has become a large draw for those who want to view truly unique wildlife, including the beautiful yet deadly poison frogs and absolutely gigantic insects. Costa Rican resorts have taken things a step further by offering unique lodging opportunities, such as jungle tree houses that place you right in the middle of the action. It may not be the Garden of Eden, but it's really close. Unfortunately, it wasn't always this way. Historically, Costa Rica was treated as a colony by other countries and by large international businesses. Banana plantations once dominated parts of the country. These operations required the clear cutting of the biodiverse jungle to make way for banana monoculture. Although this industry produced jobs, it took a heavy toll on the environment. Over time, Costa Ricans retook their country and set for themselves a goal of environmental excellence. Today, this little country is considered the epicenter of the budding ecotourism industry. Now let's hear from a Costa Rican developer, Rob Jacks, as he tells us how he intends to protect the wildlife and environment in his five-star eco-resort. So there are three species of monkeys, uh, all the way from the big Congo monkeys, the Howler monkeys, if you will, down to the little small white-faced uh, monkeys. There's sloths, and, and as you remember from yesterday's walk around the forest, we happened to find a sloth hanging in the tree. Yeah. So we've got uh, butterflies, hummingbirds, uh, there are snakes, lizards, uh, the, the whole gamut of, of animals you would expect to find in the rainforest. It is so, there are so many animals here for us to deal with that part of our plan is we will have our own forest range. We will have our own game wardens to help us manage all the different animals that are here. One of the things that's really um, an interesting opportunity for us is how are we going to deal with rain. Costa Rica gets an abundant amount of rain. In addition to that, you can imagine with all of the things I just described, the amount of water usage we're going to require and the amount of waste that we're going to create. So we've been working on a, a plan to construct a waste treatment water reuse facility that is going to take in that waste and give us back basically clean, pure water that we'll add to the creeks. We can use it in our water features. We can make very good use of that water so that we're minimizing what we have to pull from the city or what we might have to drill for. In addition to that, we're not placing any waste back into the system. All of that becomes biodegradable. It is removed from the site and taken to the appropriate disposal facilities um, out away from the, the resort. Costa Rica is known around the world for its incredible fishing. Understandably, they want to protect this unique natural resource and consequently great importance is placed on protecting water quality. That's why I'm here. My goal is to tailor an advanced wastewater treatment system to our site needs. In short, the system needs to be capable of accepting a concentrated sewer inflow that is then consumed by bacteria in a biological reactor. After this, the treated water will be pulled through a high-tech filter. This filter will remove any remaining particulates and produce crystal clear water that is so clean that it can be safely reused on site for landscape irrigation and water features. Now, let's meet Matt Stapleford of General Electric and learn more about this treatment system. What's impressed me is, is the awareness and the importance they've put on their, on their natural ecosystem. It's, it's quite impressive, actually. Um, 
more often than not, people have the not in my backyard philosophy, saying, you know what, as long as it's not in my way, I don't have to worry about it. But they've done a very nice job defining how they want to keep their water water systems pristine. They don't want to chop, chop down the forest. They want minimal impact. So GE Water Process Technologies basically is a collection of different technologies that GE has acquired over the years to give a full portfolio of products for any sort of water treatment solution that a government agency, a private agency, any, any industry would really need. GE's MBR system utilizes two different stages and when we say MBR or membrane bioreactor we tend to say them all at once but there's two discrete phases. One is the bioreactor and that's pretty standard compar compared to conventional treatment and, and other MBR technologies. Um, it's just basically a suspended biomass and it will do the job of degrading as much organic material um, as it can in that time. You design it and you can design it for nutrient removal like nitrogen or phosphorus. And then ultimately what you've got is you've literally got a tank of, of what looks like muddy, muddy, muddy water and now the question is how do you settle that out? Well in this case we use a UF membrane um, the UF membrane is literally suspended right in the tank of this liquid and we simply draw a small vacuum to pull the water to permeate through these membranes. And of course what happens is you get solids accumulation on the membranes because you're pulling this dirty water in and what we do is we aerate the membranes periodically with different techniques and what that does is creates a nice mixing and a cross flow and then we just take the concentrated mixed liquor as we call it and we send it back to the bioreactor in a big loop all the time. So really, the, there's, there's no real waste from the technology, um, except for occasionally you'll waste sludge to keep the biomass or the biopopulation under control. It's a very straightforward process. So UF is the, the range, or ultrafiltration is the range of 0.01 to 0.1 microns. So that is the, the cutoff between where something will be rejected and where something will pass through the membrane. Now, I, lend, I tend to tell people that the good rule of thumb is if it's dissolved, it will pass through the membrane, and if it's a suspended particle, something that's not dissolved in the water itself, a UF membrane will typically remove it completely. That includes viruses and bacteria. Bacteria in general are large enough that it's very safe to say that you can get a six log removal of a, a bacteria. Some of the viruses are a little bit smaller, and they're, they, they fall into the same range as ultrafiltration. Um, depending on the virus, you can get anywhere from two to four log removal. It's a tag team effort, right? So you have dissolved material in wastewater that you've got to treat, and you've got suspended material in wastewater you've got to treat. The membrane kind of helps in both categories. First of all, it's just going to filter out anything that's particulate in the wastewater. And then the other thing we do is we combine a membrane with a biological treatment process, just a suspended growth of bacteria and their job is to eat and process all the dissolved stuff. The problem is with a conventional technology that does very much the same thing, you've still got to actually retain all that biomass. You've got to capture it or separate it out again. And what the UF membrane does is it allows you to actually keep all the bacteria where you want so they can do their job and eat all the dissolved stuff. And then the membrane stops anything that's particulate that was in the wastewater and it keeps all the bacteria and the biomass where you want it and you have absolutely nothing afterwards. So it's, it's a very stark contrast between mixed liquor, which is doing the biological work, and you can go through one tiny little membrane and the water comes out crystal clear. Although I absolutely love working in Costa Rica, you don't have to go all the way to Central America to witness people trying to protect and improve the environment. We have a large number of OERB cleanup projects occurring here in Oklahoma that use the same biological treatment processes as those that we just learned about at the resort. The only difference is that here we are using bacteria in the soil to consume oil residues at abandoned oil production sites. So we're here west of Maud today with Rodney Troglin of Beacon Environmental and we're looking at a site that they're going to bioremediate and clean up the oil that's been released to the surface here. Now Rodney, if you would, start us out with a little history of the site. Well, this site was turned into us, um, and we had a uh, an old pit. Uh, it was a, an oil pit, and it sat back over here on the on the hillside. And the uh, uh, this is a process in which we 
used to remediate uh, oil and, and paraffin and that sort of thing that we find in these old pits. A lot of times there'll be tank bottoms and real thick heavy oil in these pits that, that just will sit there for years and years and decades uh, and not treat itself. Uh, but when we uh, are able to, to find a piece of, uh, of property that we can use uh, a land farm cell on, we can usually uh, bioremediate these in about uh, 12 months to two years. Okay. Now you mentioned two things that some people may not be familiar with. One was paraffins and the other one's tank bottoms. What are those? Well, the tank bottoms is just the uh, the old heavy oil that, is, that has been over the years and it'll have sand and uh, other heavy materials that fall out of the oil and it settles in the bottom of the tank so it's a real waxy uh, thick material that uh, uh, that is not useful for uh, uh, refining or, or such as that and the paraffin is the same way it's, it's a waxy substance that's found in oil and it, uh, uh, it settles into the to the tank bottoms or uh, and that, that's where they try to get rid of this at is in, a, in old pits and that sort of thing. So when you find the old pits, they're just like small ponds that have this material in the bottom of it? Yeah, we find them in different, uh, different states. Some of them will have fences around them where they've tried to keep the cattle from, from wading out into the oil and getting stuck. Uh, some of them will just be covered over with, uh, with a foot or two of, of soil where they've tried to, to you know, cover over the material and, and, and get rid of it that way. But it still just encapsulates it and it sits there for decades without being uh, you know, remediated. So you come in once you find one of these spots, you dig that up and then you spread it out on adjoining property? Well, this is, uh, this is the area that we selected on this property and you can see this is bermed uh, so to, to uh, uh, eliminate any runoff that might go into uh, surface waters. Uh, but what we do is we bring that out of the pit and we apply it in three to four inch uh, lifts within the land farm cell. And uh, within that uh, land farm cell, we also add uh, soil amendments to uh, expedite the uh, remediation process. What kind of amendments do you add? Well, on this side here, we, uh, we added uh, wood chips, uh, we added um, urea, and uh, uh, oftentimes we use hay uh, instead of wood chips, and then we also use manure, which helps to uh, speed up the bacterial growth and, and break down the oil into its components. So as you add soil amendments it gives some body to that oil and it also gives a way for the water and the uh, sunlight to, to penetrate and to uh, remediate the, the site. So if we look at this soil on the ground here in front of us what we can see is these larger chunks. The, this, these, I guess this is the tank bottoms? Yes that would be the uh, oil and tank bottoms and it's uh, uh, has been has been tilled uh, several times, so it's 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 beginning to break down. You see, it's when we put it in here, the consistency is is something like uh, uh, pudding or uh, you know a heavy grease. Really. So uh, you can see that yeah. uh, as we uh, mix this with the soil and with the amendments, it begins to to form uh, a substance similar to soil. Well, I notice it's still a little shiny when I break it open. You can see it's still. A little bit more. Right, there, we, so. we have some active oil in there. This side is is not quite uh, uh, complete. Uh, we're going to add some more amendments in the future yeah. to uh, to help uh, break this side on down uh, a little better. Do you ever come out and water the 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 land farm, or do you just let it naturally? No, we we usually uh, just allow natural uh, processes to take place there. Uh, we're not in any any hurry right. to speed this along. I mean, we have time working on our side and usually the, the warmer and moister the, the summers are, the, the faster it remediates. So how does the urea or the manure help speed the process up? Well, the, the, the urea and the manure just uh, helps feed the microbes in the soil yeah. and the microbes in the soil uh, will break the fertilizer, will break the, the oil down into fertilizer. Um, you know, if you're familiar with Fertilize, it's a it's a oil-based product. Right. So oil is really uh, one of the easier uh, things that we treat because it will break down in the grasses and things we use it for fertilize. So you said 12 months uh, to do this. Do you ever see it go any faster than that, or? 
uh, it can go faster than that, uh, depending upon the uh, total petroleum hydrocarbons that's in the tank bottoms uh, and in the in the pit itself. It can go faster than that if it's a, if it's a reduced rate or the, the. It also has to do with the consistency that we pull out of the pit. Sometimes we just have some sandy. Uh, soil that is impacted with oil and you yeah. put that on the surface and it treats quickly. Yeah. But if you have something such as this, which is the heavy tank bottom paraffin and, uh, and the uh, thick uh, waxy substance, it takes a little longer to treat. A lot longer. Now I've been on sites where I've seen this kind of material that's been leaked out over the years and it almost looks like asphalt. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, obviously that's what uh, is utilized uh, in asphalt is, is uh, some, some used oil, old oil um, and rocks and that sort of thing. So as it sits there on the surface, it combines with the, uh, the sand and the rocks on the surface to create a substance that's very similar to asphalt. Now, they also used to, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they used to put the tank bottoms on some of the roads, didn't they? Yes, and uh, oftentimes uh, you can still get permitting to do that you can. Uh, on lease roads and uh, on county roads that are sandy and that sort of thing. It makes a great road material because uh, it does stay put. Uh, if you get it packed in, it's not going away. Uh, that's why we have to, to fluff it and get it, yeah. get it with all the amendments to, to get it to go away. And when we're finished, it's one of the most productive areas of the pasture. So you're basically building the soil back yes. up, putting carbon back into the soil, but you're breaking it down to, to a, useful, a useful carbon that the grass mm -hmm. can actually use. You're adding nutrients, which also helps. Right. So once, once you're done, then they can run cattle on this or do what, anything they want to anything with it. Anything they want to with it. Very interesting. Well, Rodney, we really appreciate you for coming out today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Everyone's familiar with pathogenic bacteria. Those are the bacteria that make us sick. However, we often overlook the multitude of beneficial bacteria that assist us as humans in maintaining our level of lifestyle and our environmental quality. In today's episode, we've seen two different examples of bacteria and how they're used to remove undesirable contaminants from both water and soil. We hope you enjoyed today's show, and don't forget, go to LandDoctors.com for more information on this and other shows, and as always, hang around after the credits for a little land yap. I need the Oklahoma wind to run open through my veins. I need the Grass to cut right through these long and lonesome days homeward bound. I'm homeward bound. I hear a scissor tail calling me from the redwood trees. I hear the top water roaring still of the day as the bass. Are you a land doctor? Do you have a beautiful piece of property that you'd love to share with the world? If so, drop us a line at LandDoctors.com. We'd love to hear from you and maybe even include you on a future show. Everywhere you go in Costa Rica, you hear people say Pura Vida. That literally translates to pure life. But the way that they use it, it's more like this is really living or this is the only way to live. And I tend to agree with them. I found myself enjoying Costa Rica more than I ever imagined that I would. From the friendly people to the great food to the beautiful, beautiful natural setting, I couldn't imagine anything any better. 
And after I got finished with my business activities and looking at the site that we're going to develop, I had to take advantage of the fishing and we went out for a day long fishing trip. If you get a chance, go to Costa Rica and enjoy it for yourself. Pura Vida. Costa Rica, baby! <laughs> That is a big sail. That's not a sail, is it? What? That's a mark. No, that's a sail. would like to thank GE Water and Process Technologies for our use of the Z-Weed graphics in this program. This program is sponsored in part by the Oklahoma Energy Resources Board. The OERB is voluntarily funded by Oklahoma's oil and natural gas producers and royalty owners, and their funds are being used for well site restoration and student education all across the state. Since 1993, the OERB has restored more than 13,000 orphaned and abandoned well sites at no cost to landowners or taxpayers employing Oklahoma contractors all along the way. The OERB is proud to serve the state of Oklahoma. Daddy, where did those come from? Well, let me tell you. Plains Kubota, your Oklahoma Kubota dealer and proud sponsor of the Land Doctors. Kubota, for Earth, for life. This program is sponsored and produced by the Land Doctors Management Group. We all know that Oklahomans belong to the land, but even the best of us need a little help from time to time. If you've got a spot of land that you love but would like to make it even better, we're here to help. Whether it's wildlife, water management, natural resources management, environmental cleanup, or even real estate development, these doctors are always on call. I love the smell of fresh dirt in the morning. It smells like victory. <laughs> <laughs>